It's hard to overstate the revolutionary contribution DNA has made not only to our understanding of biology, but to the realm of criminal justice. Initially discovered in 1953, it would take more than 30 years before the Nobel Prize winning discovery was viable for use in the field of forensics, following the work of British geneticist Alec Jeffries in the early 1980s. While DNA was inevitably first utilized to help law enforcement, it was only a few short years before its value was also realized as a tool for the wrongfully convicted. Indeed, as of 2013, all 50 states in America have passed post-conviction statutes concerning access to DNA testing, and DNA evidence has been responsible for over 360 exonerations in the U.S. since 1989. Despite its usefulness, however, you might be surprised to find out that DNA evidence has only featured in a minority of exoneration cases in the U.S., though legal advocacy organizations like the Innocence Project are working to change that. Combined with continuous improvements to the science, DNA testing has nevertheless earned its reputation as the gold standard of exculpatory evidence. Today, we want to take a look at some historic U.S. exoneration cases involving DNA, focusing on scientific achievements, notable landmarks, and overall importance to the realm of criminal justice. Before we get to the main video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest content. Also, if you're wondering why we didn't include cases like Kennedy Brewer or LaVon Brooks that appeared in Netflix's new series The Innocence Files, we opted to leave them for an upcoming video. Be sure to look out for that in the next few days. With that out of the way, here is our list of seven historic U.S. DNA exoneration cases. In 1989, Gary Dotson was cleared of the aggravated kidnapping and rape of Kathleen Crowell Webb after having spent more than eight years in prison and several others in legal battles attempting to prove his innocence. Though Webb recanted her earlier testimony in 1985, admitting that she had fabricated the rape allegation in an attempt to hide legitimate sexual activity with her boyfriend from her foster parents, Dotson was refused a new trial. Following three days of widely televised hearings, which were highly sensational and unheard of for the time, trial judge Richard L. Samuels rejected the new evidence, saying that Webb's recantation was less credible than her original testimony. Later in 1985, though he was still refused a pardon, Dotson's sentence was briefly commuted to the six years he had already served by the governor of Illinois. This was later revoked, however, as the commutation was based on good behavior and Dotson had subsequently been involved in two alleged assaults. It wasn't until 1988 when DNA testing not available at the time of the trial was performed on Webb's clothing. The evidence excluded the possibility of Dotson being involved in the case and was furthermore a positive match to Webb's boyfriend from the time of the incident. In the summer of 1989, Dotson finally had all charges against him dropped, becoming the first person to be exonerated of a criminal conviction by DNA evidence. Kirk Bloodsworth's 1993 release and eventual exoneration marked the first time DNA testing had ever proved the innocence of someone sentenced to death. Though this had been commuted to two consecutive life sentences by the time of his DNA evidence appeal, Bloodsworth spent two of his nearly nine years in prison on death row after being convicted of the brutal 1984 rape and murder of a nine-year-old girl in Maryland. Five eyewitnesses who claimed to have seen Bloodsworth with the victim were largely responsible for the outcome of his trial, but he continued to maintain his innocence throughout his incarceration, ultimately leading to a major stroke of luck. In 1992, Bloodsworth read an account of a murder case in England, detailing both how DNA evidence had led to the conviction of the real killer and the exoneration of an earlier suspect. He proceeded to push for such testing in his own case, resulting in a negative match to DNA samples recovered from the scene of the crime. It would take more than his release to secure a full exoneration, however. Almost a decade after, DNA evidence added to state and federal databases resulted in a match to the real killer. Kimberly Shea Ruffner. In a shocking coincidence, Ruffner had not only been incarcerated at the same institution as Bloodsworth a mere month after the rape and killing on an unrelated case, his cell was only one floor below. In fact, the men were familiar with one another and sometimes spotted each other during workouts. Ruffner pled guilty to the 1984 rape and murder in 2004, and Bloodsworth received his full exoneration. The 
William Gregory case remains historic not only as the first DNA exoneration in the state of Kentucky, but as the first exoneration to rely on mitochondrial DNA testing exclusively. After his conviction in the burglary and rape of one woman and an attempted rape of another in 1993, William Gregory received a 70-year sentence. While the hair evidence that eventually led to his exoneration was presented at trial, the prosecution relied on now discredited visual analysis of the hairs, as only hairs containing the full follicles attached contained sufficient quantities of the nuclear DNA required for testing. Combined with the testimony of their two supposed eyewitnesses, the state was able to secure a conviction and Gregory would spend the next seven years incarcerated. After exhausting his appeals, Gregory contacted the Innocence Project, who by now were able to employ the newly available mitochondrial testing in this case. Gregory was excluded as the source of the hairs in the first test, and after a series of tests run by the prosecution, they also concluded the hairs did not belong to him. He was released in the year 2000. Paula Gray was the first woman ever to be exonerated via DNA evidence, following her conviction in connection with the notorious Ford Heights 4 case. The case centered around the high-profile 1978 rape and murders of a young couple in Illinois, and the four men subsequently convicted of the crimes on false forensic testimony and police coercion of a witness. That witness was Paula Gray, a teenager with a mild intellectual disability who the police interrogated and held without legal counsel for two days before she testified to a grand jury, implicating the four men police suspected of committing the crimes. Though Gray later recanted her testimony at a preliminary hearing, it merely resulted in her also being charged in the rape and murder case, where she would eventually be convicted alongside three of the four other suspects, personally receiving a 50-year sentence. In 1982, Gray received a new deal from the state in exchange for her testimony against two of her co-defendants who had won retrials, as well as the fourth man initially charged in the case, Verniel Jimerson. She was released in 1985 after serving a total of nine years for a crime she didn't commit. It wasn't until 1996, however, that DNA testing would exonerate all five defendants, also leading to the conviction of the real perpetrators and a full pardon for Gray in 2002. Gray's exoneration is even more noteworthy when you consider that it is one of the exceedingly few DNA exonerations involving women even now. Though exact numbers are hard to come by, according to the Innocence Project, as of 2010, only four women, including Gray, had ever been exonerated in the U.S. as a result of DNA evidence. Much like in the case of William Gregory, the evidence that eventually exonerated Ricky Johnson constituted a major technical leap in the realm of DNA testing. In 2008, Johnson would become the first person exonerated using what's known as mini-STR DNA testing after serving 25 years in prison for a rape he didn't commit. In the summer of 1982, a 22-year-old Louisiana woman was held at gunpoint and raped over the course of several hours in her home. The man told her his name was Marcus Johnson and that he was from the city of Leesville. When detectives in the case contacted the Leesville Police Department, they said they had no record of a Marcus Johnson, instead pointing them towards Ricky Johnson, who was on parole for a minor traffic violation at the time. Though there were surface-level similarities between the details the victim had provided and Ricky Johnson, the case was poorly investigated. After being identified in a flawed photo lineup that included an eight-year-old photo of Johnson, no other suspects were considered in the investigation. The prosecution's case rested almost exclusively on this photo identification at trial, as well as blood type evidence that, while common at the time, showed that as much as 35% of the African-American population also could have been the contributor of. After his conviction, Johnson spent two decades in prison before catching two lucky breaks. First, he contacted the Innocence Project at the suggestion of fellow inmate Calvin Willis, who was exonerated in 2003 by DNA evidence. Secondly, in the early 2000s, many STR DNA testing became newly available, allowing labs to accurately test extremely small or degraded DNA samples. Tests proved that Johnson could not have been the attacker and also later implicated the real perpetrator, John McNeil. Ricky Johnson was fully exonerated and released from prison in 2008. Michael Mercer's 2003 DNA exoneration in a 1991 rape case was instrumental in affirming the value of state and federal DNA databases. The case against Mercer relied exclusively on victim identification, 
and though the jury could not reach a verdict in the first trial, he was found guilty and given a 20 to 41 year sentence at his second trial in 1992. While New York would become the first state to pass a statute regarding post-conviction DNA testing in 1994, Mercer was initially denied testing in his case on the grounds that there was no viable DNA to test. As DNA technology improved, however, so did efforts to create state and federal databases. With the completion of the FBI's Combined DNA Index System, or CODIS, in 1998, marking the first major milestone in this process. CODIS enabled federal, state, and local forensics labs to exchange and compare DNA profiles electronically for the first time. Beginning in 2000, two important things happened. New York passed a state law requiring all convicted felons to provide a DNA sample for the state database, and New York City began a project that tested old rape kits in its storage facilities, comparing the results to those in the database. Michael Mercer was one of the inmates who provided such a DNA sample. In 2003, it was found that not only did the DNA evidence in the 1991 case exclude Mercer, it actually was a match to Arthur Brown, a man convicted of several other rapes and robberies. Mercer was exonerated and released later in 2003 after 12 years in prison. In all, over 17,000 rape cases were cleared as part of New York City's backlog project, leading to several other convictions and exonerations. Though there is certainly no shortage of interesting details about the case, What's perhaps most notable about Craig Coley's conviction and subsequent exoneration are his records as both the longest serving inmate ever to be exonerated by DNA evidence and, recently, as the recipient of the largest monetary settlement resulting from such a case. Charged with the 1978 murders of his ex-girlfriend Rhonda Wicht and her four-year-old son Donald, the case relied heavily on the testimony of a single witness, a neighbor who claimed to have seen a man resembling Coley driving away from Wicht's apartment complex the morning of the murders. Though the initial trial resulted in a hung jury, Coley was convicted at a second trial in 1980 on two counts of first-degree murder. He would remain incarcerated for almost 39 years. Despite this, Coley continued to maintain his innocence, and almost a decade later, a detective with the Simi Valley Police Department named Michael Bender began to reinvestigate the case. He had discovered problems with the investigation, and with the help of several other in the department, began to lobby on Coley's behalf for a re-examination of the case. Though he was unsuccessful for many years, Bender caught a lucky break in 2015 when he got the attention of then-California Governor Jerry Brown. First, new investigators were able to seriously undermine the testimony of the primary witness in the case, proving that she could not have possibly seen who was in a truck parked outside from her apartment window. However, the real exculpatory evidence came from the DNA found at the scene. Though it was thought to have been destroyed, a piece of Rondewick's bed sheets were recovered and found to have sperm from another man on it, but it contained no DNA from Craig Coley, Coley was released and fully pardoned in 2017, and in early 2019 received a $21 million settlement from the city of Simi Valley, California. It is currently the largest settlement of its kind in connection with a wrongful conviction. That brings us to the end of our list. Are there any other DNA exoneration cases you'd like to hear about? Also, don't forget to subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest videos. Thank you for watching.